And this is going to be 5.4, Alexander the Great and the Legacy of Greece. We're going to look at uh, Greece heading into what's called the Hellenistic Era, where it expands beyond Greece into places like Egypt, too. So, our objectives, we are going to explain how Alexander the Great built an extensive empire. We're going to describe the empire's impact culturally and identify major Hellenistic Greek scientists and their discoveries and their innovations, of which there are many. So... When we last left off, the Persian Wars had ended, but the, Mes uh, the, the Peloponnesian Wars had also uh, really helped to wreck the uh, Athens and Sparta and the great city-states of uh, Greece. And this left the door open for the, Mes the, the Macedonians to come in. So in 338 BCE, the Macedonians, which were north of Greece, uh, invaded and they conquered this area. Um, the independence of the Greek city-states were over, and Greece turned into an empire after this. Um, the eventual leader of the Macedonians, though, Alexander the Great, was in love with Greek culture, and so uh, he sort of appropriated and took on a lot of the culture of the Greeks um, and made it his own, and then he expanded it all over the world as he expanded his empire. So, let's look at Alexander. The Macedonians were... Uh, up north, but they considered themselves Greek, uh, and they held on to their connections with the Greeks, uh, especially Philip II, the father of Alexander. Uh, he loved Greek culture. Uh, he even hired Aristotle to be Alexander the Great's uh, tutor. So here's Philip II. He's the one with the beard. Uh, so over time, Philip II continued to grow in power and land and prestige. He made alliances with a lot of the Greek city-states, but in his heart, he was thinking of conquering them. And then in 338 BCE, Philip uh, II defeated the Athenians and conquered the Greek city-states. So here is uh, ancient Macedonia at the time of his death, uh, expanding into uh, ancient Greece as well. Now, Philip II also wanted to conquer the Persians. Um, he never liked the Persians because the Persians had attacked Greece, and he he took that personally. Um, however, before he could uh, fully take on and conquer the Persians, Philip II was assassinated. We're not sure exactly on whose orders, although some people say it might have been Alexander, his son. Um, and uh, an assassination is somebody when we murder a public figure, uh, often for political purposes. Uh, after the death of Philip II, Alexander the Great took power. Uh, and so here is the death of Philip II. Alexander the Great became a king at 20 years old. However, he was already a pretty seasoned fighter. He had been in battle since he was about 13. Uh, and he had the same idea that his dad did. Let's get Persia. And Persia was not as powerful as they once had been when they were the great powerful empire that we saw back in uh, chapter 2. And so Alexander chased them all over the ancient world, won many victories against the Persians, and eventually moved up through the Middle East, capturing not only Persia, but Palestine and Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia by 331 BCE. So this is how he got the nickname the Great, is by conquering. So here is the his empire as well. It is huge. Um, there's the famous quote from Die Hard where they said, And when Ale Alexander saw the breadth of his empire, he wept, for there were no more worlds to conquer. And so here we see that he did do quite a bit of conquering. He did not, however, conquer everything. Um, he uh, moved east. He was looking to march into China. I'm, I'm sorry, not China, but India. Um, eventually, though, his troops were basically like, look, we are tired of marching. Uh, we want to go home. And Alexander realized that if he didn't head back, he might lose his army. They might just up and revolt. Uh, so he stopped the invasion of India at the Hindu Kush range and headed back towards uh, Babylon. Uh, unfortunately, that is as far as he got. Uh, before he could restart uh, his conquests, he died of a fever or perhaps murder or really it was probably just fever. Um, but he, uh, the problem was he didn't really say who his second in command was supposed to be. Um, he didn't really name a successor, at least not one that we knew about. Uh, according to a myth, he may have shouted to the strongest when asked who was going to replace him, or he might have said a name, or he might have never said anything. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell because it's all mythology. Uh, unfortunately for his empire, sorry, I'm just, uh, um, after, uh, nobody else really could be Alexander after Alexander died. 
Uh, and so after years of infighting, uh, Alexander the Great's empire was divided up amongst uh, some of his most powerful remaining generals, uh, and they took over Greece and Persia and Egypt. And so for the next 300 years, these families uh, fought each other for control and dominance of the ancient world. So here's the death of Alexander, uh, and here are the uh, major uh, groups that uh, were uh, created after the death. So uh, one of them is the Ptolemaic kingdom, which is ancient Egypt. Uh, Cleopatra was a Ptolemaic pharaoh. Uh, we see the Antigonids up in Greece, the Seleucids in Persia and Asia Minor, uh, and all the other Greek city-states on the left there. Now, let's look at the legacy of Alexander the Great. Although he had a pretty short reign, uh, his love of Greek culture helped to push Greek culture across the world, and it expanded the Greek way of life. Many of these cities founded by Alexander the Great eventually were named after him, and a lot of these new cities sort of became central uh, hubs for their regions. Um, we also see that Greek culture tended to expand with Alexander the Great. However, um, it also sort of absorbed other parts. It sort of took the bits and pieces of other cultures that they liked, and so oftentimes it was sort of a blend of Greek and other uh, cultures sort of blending together. Uh, and we call this uh, time period and this sort of blending uh, the Hellenistic era, where we see it has Greek influence, but also Persian and Egyptian and Indian. And so this is the Hellenistic or Greek-like era. So for instance, here is a statue of Alexander the Great in Egypt as a pharaoh. Now, at the center of the Hellenistic world, after uh, the death of Alexander the Great, was the city of Alexandria, named after him, uh, in Egypt, uh, northern Egypt. Uh, it was very easily accessible because uh, it was a port city. Uh, it did very well. Uh, the Ptolemies ruled out of uh, uh, Alexandria. Uh, and the city was also known for its giant lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, uh, majestic giant lighthouse of Alexandria. Now, Alexander the Great had been a supporter of the arts and the sciences, and we see this in the city of Alexandria, which had a huge library. The Library of Alexandria was well known as being massive. Uh, it also had a museum, it had lecture halls and zoos, and uh, a massive library. Basically, any ship that stopped in the port of Alexandria was searched, and any books were taken to the library and copied and then returned. Uh, unfortunately, there were several fires uh, which means that we have very few scrolls left over from the Library of Alexandria. Uh, here are just some of the ancient ruins of Alexandria. This is what we think the lighthouse looked like. It was destroyed by an earthquake in the 1300s, so we cannot be 100% sure what it used to look like. However, in the Hellenistic era, we also see that women are having more freedom than they had before. Women were able to read and to write and were poets and scientists. Uh, we saw that Cleopatra VII, the Ptolemaic uh, Cleopatra, uh, became one of the most powerful rulers of that time. Um, she was powerful in Egypt. She was powerful in Rome. She was powerful in Greece. She was powerful everywhere uh, until eventually she backed the wrong uh, hero in uh, a Roman civil war and ended up uh, ending her own life with a uh, what is believed to be a snake bite. Uh, we also see uh, Hypatia of Alexandria as a great example of the, the rights and powers of women. She was a scientist and the head librarian at the Library of Alexandria, uh, a brilliant scientist until she herself was killed by a uh, mob of Roman Christians because she was a pagan. Now let's look at Hellenistic arts and sciences. The Hellenistic era saw a lot of new art architects and artists come to the forefront uh, all trying to bring glory to Hellenistic rulers and showing how modern and powerful they all were. Um, there was still a lot of political fighting going on at this time, and uh, a lot of these fights led to new philosophies being created. So we have the philosopher Zeno, who created philosophy known as Stoicism. A Stoic believes that you should avoid highs and, lo highs and lows and sort of accept whatever life gives to you. It's almost a uh, in my reckoning of it, it's it's almost a little bit like Taoism, just kind of uh, rolling with what comes uh, your way. 
Now, Stoics also were standing up for human rights and claimed that although women and slaves were not quite equal to men, uh, they should be uh, viewed as morally equal. Uh, this is going to be important to later philosophers as well. So here is the philosopher Zeno. He's the one with the beard. So uh, the Hellenistic era saw a mathematical and scientific revolution as well. Um, we saw lots of new knowledge from these areas, uh, and generally when they got conquered, they shared whatever knowledge they had with the Greeks. So we have the mathematicians like Pythagoras, uh, who invented the formula for calculating the relationship between the sides of a right triangle. Uh, and his proofs later uh, inspired later mathematicians and philosophers as well. So we have the Pythagorean theorem right here, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Uh, we also have Euclid, who basically uh, invented modern Greek geometry. Uh, he wrote a book called The Elements, uh, and his work inspired later mathematicians um, and is still the basis of the geometry classes that you're all going to take as sophomores. So next year when you're trying to figure whatever this is out, uh, just thank Euclid for me. We have Aristarchus, a scientist who argued for a heliocentric theory of the universe where the sun was the center of the universe and we revolved around it, not the other way around. Uh, and it took about 2,000 years for modern scientists to uh, agree with him and also not get executed for it. Uh, we also see Eratosthenes, who was able to uh, complete experiments that proved that the world was round uh, and was able to very closely, uh, accurately guess the circumference of uh, it as well. Um, so here's Aristarchus's heliocentric model. Perhaps one of the most famous and almost mythological characters is Archimedes. Uh, he was a great scientist to the point where some people have mentioned that he made things that didn't actually exist. Um, however, he liked practical inventions. He uh, liked levers and pulleys, and he developed a screw that could actually take water up a hill. Uh, he also invented weapons of war uh, that he used to defend his hometown of Syracuse when it was invaded. By the Romans. So here is the Archimedes screw, as it's called, taking water uphill by screwing it up. He also allegedly developed lots of things like, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, he uh, like a laser beam, allegedly, uh, or uh, other things like that. Most of it untrue. Uh, about 400 BCE, we also have Hippocrates. Hippocrates was a doctor investi investigating the causes of disease. And nowadays, if you want to become a doctor, you have to swear an oath to do no harm, uh, which is called the Hippocratic Oath after this guy Hippocrates. Um, you have to promise to be ethical and to not harm your patients and to, uh, you know, fix any patient that you see before you. Here is Hippocrates. He's the one with the beard. Now, this Greek legacy still does survive in our art and our architecture and our science, um, even though Greece was conquered by Rome in about 133. Uh, we see that uh, the Greek government inspired modern governments. We see that uh, Greek philosophers uh, taught us how to think critically and set up the modern education system. Uh, later on, we are going to see the huge impact that the Greeks had on the Romans as well. Uh, that's going to be in 6.1 and 6.2, which we'll finish up the semester with.